This video is about the moral landscape and the conversation on waking up with Sam Harris's podcast between Sam Harris and David Deutsch. What they're talking about is the, the book, The Moral Landscape. In, in part, they're also talking about underpinnings of theories of reality and how that comes to play with morality. Now, I'm not a huge fan of morality as a ob objective thing. I look at it more as a goal-oriented thing, meaning what are your values? How are you going to achieve those goals and those values? Um, I'm taking the position of a moral relativist in the sense that a behavior is does not a morality make. So you can't put a moratorium on a behavior you would have to look at the context of that behavior to say if it's a, it's a constructive or a destructive act. Oftentimes we get bogged down into actual actions instead of looking at, well, why did the person behave the way they did? And trying to understand that the person isn't necessarily bad. They might have had bad information. They might have had bad goals. Um, they might have been acting under uh, false, false assumptions. Helping people to be in control of their actions is a good thing, but it's not everything. We want to understand why people are acting, and it would be a good role both as, as other people and as individuals. We want to understand our actions in context of the behavior around us. Morality, in a general term, is just how do we want to organize our society. Now, you would say there can be distinctions between your personal moral preferences and then the preferences of others or the preference of a society. So you can have three levels of preferences, other preferences, society's preferences, and your individual preferences. So we can have a three-pronged three ethical framework, meaning I won't do it, but I don't have a moratorium for you to do it. And this is an interesting thing that I think Harris has a problem with. He says, if it's moral for me, it should be moral for you. And therefore, if it's immoral for me, it should be immoral for you. I don't necessarily think that's a correct framework. And so that's one of the key points that I would say is that you can, people want a universal. They want to say, well, if it this is moral for anyone in any circumstance, that's not going to happen. And that's why I'm a moral relativist. Now, this has a caveat um, in that we have a shared reality. We live as humans. And as humans, we have basic desires, I will call them, not needs. I, I'm a little queasy about needs because I want people to take responsibility instead of saying, well, that's my need. No, it's, you, it's your desire. Now, it's born out of a basic biological um, instinct to want that. You know, food, you, I need food. Well, you don't necessarily need that food and you don't necessarily need food right now. What I'm trying to do is separate between Yes, I understand you have a desire, and this is a normal human desire, but it's, we're still going to classify it as a want so that we can take responsibility for our actions. Um, so this is, what, this is why I have problems with needs versus wants. I want people to take responsibility. A need is something they don't have to take responsibility for. I need air. Well... You should make sure you have clean air to, to have so you can breathe. I hope that's not too fine of a point to make here, but I do like to separate between needs and wants. A need is a, it's an antecedent of want. It's not a, it, it does not describe what you want. Needs cannot describe what you want. Needs can Needs do describe what you want. Excuse me, I got that exactly backwards. Needs describe what you want. Not, they are not in themselves alone. And, and this is where people get, I think, get very stuck. They, they think there is a, such a thing as a need versus want. Needs describe the want. So needs come before the want, or, 
excuse me, wants come before the needs. See, I'm back in on that round all, all the time. And maybe that was how we did it. We wrote it down wrong originally. No, but the point of it is, is that if we assume that there is no universal need, right? We don't need, the universe does not need us to survive. Show me that the universe needs us to survive and I will reconsider this point. I don't see any fundamental need for the universe unless your argument is, well, the universe needs someone to watch it. Well, okay, that's a good argument. That's a good starting point. Show me where you're going to get from there. Okay, so I started the point that let's just assume everything's a want. Let's say I want to live. I don't need to live. I want to live. It's something I want. Okay, or I want to die. That's a want. Anyways, so I take a very, I take a very different approach to ethics than Harris and David Deutsch. Um, Sam, I think, is, and I think even David is a little confused with what to do with morality. Now, we agree on many aspects of their conversation in terms of the fact that I am an informationalist. I do believe that we are fundamentally information and that there is, that what we're talking about is a distinction from our substrate. Now, in the book, The Beginning of Infinity, what David is basically saying is the information layer, that's the layer we live in, is separate from the physical layer. Um, we have been abstracted from that layer over time because the abstraction has allowed us to analyze our environment more accurately and give, gives us a better picture of the universe. So we become a universal engine, as he likes to refer to it. And so we look for explanations that can go beyond physical explanations, and we created God. I mean, that's how God got created. I mean, God makes a lot of sense when you look at a universal constructor. We're going to cr create all kinds of crazy ideas. And now bringing that back in is sort of where we're at right now. It's like, well, what do we do about these crazy moral ideas? And they are moral ideas. And so I agree with um, David Deutsch on this, is that these are potential ways of living. So a moral framework is simply a potential way to live. It's not the way to live. It's a potential way to live. And there are consequences for living your life that way or having those sets of rules. And unfortunately, for those people that hate game theory, you put it, reframe it in a game theory and you say, well, what happens if we extrapolate this universally? Uh, and so many times, and this is kind of what um, Immanuel Kant was going to do with his universal ethic, um, is he realized the problem with not treating people as ends in themselves. He realized that if, if we allow people to use other people for their own ends, then they become fodder for whatever ends they have. So he was like, no, we need to treat people as ends in themselves. And he was on to something. And I, I think a lot of us moral philosophers really kind of go, well, I like that idea that people should be used. They shouldn't be used. They should be considered as their own value unit. The first unit of value is the individual. And this is where values come from. So, and this is where he didn't go. And this is where I would go from the ends as individual unit, an individual. I would say the individual has wants. What are those wants? And then take those wants and then put it in with all the other wants of all the other people that have wants. And then from there we say, okay, this is what we kind of agree on. This is the moral landscape, if you will, the want landscape in this case. And we're going to map that onto Okay, if we allow these wants, what kind of society we live in? And then we need to look into that. Maybe we'll even go down that road a little bit and say, wait a second, I don't like this road very much. Let's, let's look at maybe this is not such a good idea. So, and that's moral exploration. What would happen if we extrapolate this? You know, and instead of saying this is good or bad, he said there are consequences to any action. There's no such thing as a free lunch. No action has no consequences. Okay, good or bad, there's consequences to any action. You, there is no empirically good action. Think about that. There is no empirically good action. There is no empirically bad action. It all has to do with the context of those actions. We could also say there's no empirically good word. 
It all has to do with the context of where that word was said and how it was said and what was the intent. Now, intent is a very difficult thing to demonstrate. But in context, we can have a good idea of the probable intent. But we won't know for sure the intent. And it's not necessarily even necessary to know what the actual intent was. Probable intent is probably good enough. And that can only be known within context. So let me address the elephant in the room of moral relativism. Jim Harris made a big point in his book, The Moral Landscape. Read it, understand it. He said it in many places. But this is an important concept. His problem with moral relativism is I have a situation where I throw acid into the face of a, of a woman in, in, in this case. And this in Muslim communities, it's considered, well, the right thing to do if she's, in, uh, she's unfaithful. There's a variety of circumstances where actually they throw acid in the face of people, women particularly. This is a particular punishment they have for thing. Now, he brought this um, question to a neuroscientist and her response was, well, if it's because of religion, then it's okay. Now, this is not a moral relativist position. To take a, a clear position would be this. What was the intent? Okay, it was intent to make her punish, to punish her for um, whatever in, infraction she did. Um, how does this help your community by throwing acid in her face? Would be the next question. Show me, okay, the burden of proof now is on your community to show me how this particular action is beneficial to your community and your society. So we can, her response was, we can't say anything. My response would be, and I believe is a more correct relativist position, was show me how this is beneficial. Because in my society, this is a horrendous act. This is an absolute despicable thing to do. And I have a problem with it. So you need to explain to me how it's good for my society to allow you to do this. Because if we're going to merge as a society, if we're going to communicate as a society, we have an obligation to understand one another. And there is going to be times where we say, absolutely, we're not going to agree with you and we're not going to negotiate with this. This is, this is, show, this is a showstopper. Okay. Unfortunately, commerce has, six, has, commerce is a good thing. First off, understand that the most good comes from interacting at a commerce level because needs and wants are just wants because I don't like needs, remember? See, I even still use needs. But needs in order to fulfill somebody's wants. So you can say needs and wants. I'm, I'm okay with that in theory. But the point is commerce is a very um, progressive thing to do. And it's very helpful, and it helps alleviate poverty. There are a lot of good things that come from commerce. So I don't want to simply say commerce is the enemy in this case because it's not true. What I am saying, though, is if we allow for commerce to occur when we're not also asking for a moral understanding to occur at the same time, we're going to run into problems like terrorism. Um, they're going to undermine our efforts to be a community. And really, that's what commerce wants. We want community. We want to establish what people want. And then we have people that go out and fulfill those wants, those desires. Um, sometimes we say certain desires will not be met in this community. And it's negotiable at those points. Certain communities will not allow certain behaviors. Now, and I'm willing to accept limits on things from a relativist perspective, but if your goals, I need to know what your goals are. What are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? And here we can ask a lot of questions. Well, 
why are you terrorizing us? Because you want to tell us what to do. Now, this is like the Muhammad picture. Now, I'm a moral relativist, so you would think that, oh, well, drawing a picture of Muhammad is a bad thing because it's a moral, they have the right to dictate morality. No, they don't have a right to dictate morality, nor do we have the right to dictate morality to them, but we can ask. So your response to me when I draw a picture of your God is to kill me because this is not, I don't have the right to do this. You're telling me what I can do or what I can say about your world. Now, I give you the freedom to talk about my world however you want, but you don't give me the freedom to talk about your world however you want. So this is a moral disconnect between your morality and my reality, and we have to bridge those gaps somehow. You know, we can't simply ignore them and say, well, it, well we're both right. It, no, we're, it's a disconnect because their behavior is we need to decide what is the appropriate behavior in this regard. Do we have the right to draw a picture of Muhammad and mock Muhammad? Do we have the right to draw a picture of Jesus and mock the picture of Jesus? Do we have the right to draw a picture of Richard Dawkins and mock Richard Dawkins? Okay. This is the question we're asking. Is it okay? If it's okay for one, it's okay for all. That's equality. If we can mock one thing, we can mock all things. If it's not right to lie, it's not right to lie in any situation. Now, we'll get back to lies. But, for this, that's equality. Now, is equality the best form of government? Is equality of opportunity what we want to offer everyone? Is this a constructive framework to work under? If we've decided this is a constructive framework to work under, then we need to be very honest about you. If you are having a moratorium on free speech, if you have a moratorium on, we need to discuss this. We, this is not something that we can simply walk away from and say, well, it's okay for us, but it doesn't have to be for them. We're not exporting our values. And we need to export our values. We need to have values conversations. What are your values and why do you value that? We have allowed a form of butcherized moral relativism because we assume that the human condition is not relevant to the situation. The human condition is the most relevant in this relativistic model. The human condition is what gives us the reason to negotiate because we have shared values in terms of foods, in terms of language, in terms of sexuality, in terms of we have a lot of shared values. Now, you may not see those as shared values, but they are shared values. So you can't say they're completely irrelevant. If we lived in a digital universe where we didn't, where we could define our constraints, then you could have an argument for any kind of weird religious dogma you might want to have because you'd be totally independent from this substrate, the physical substrate. So we are bound by our physical substrate to certain fundamentals. It doesn't necessarily define us, but it does confine us. And this is what I think is missing in the conversation. We need to understand that we are responsible for the conversation in terms of our values. And each individual has their own values. So going back to the acid in the face. Because we recognize the value of the individual, and that's where we derive, in the West, where we derive our values from is from the individual. We are individualist, for better or worse. This is our belief, is that values are derived from individuals, not from groups. A group does not get to decide what the value is. What gets to decide what the value is is the individual. And collectively, as individuals, we decide what we want. So, does getting acid throw it, thrown in the face of this woman constitute something she wants? Now, you may say, well, she won't want it. She might. And there's reasons for that. And it's horrendous that she might want this, but she might want this, if it means that things can go back to normal for her. We can be horrified by this. We can even say, I don't want this. In my country, you can't do, do this. 
and we really don't like the fact that you're doing this in your country. At some point, we may have to back off because there's too many variables in play and we can't interfere with that system without allowing individual freedom. Um, but there's a conversation there. You, we can't just simply say it is good or it is bad based on simple the action. We have to ask more questions. You cannot stop at a simple action and say, well, it's okay because of a single variable religion. We have to have that conversation. Now, I'm a person that would simply entertain weird things, and maybe I'm wrong to entertain those weird things. And again, it's not just me that has to have that conversation. It's the entire community. And I will, in many situations, bow to the will of the community. Because if it's what you want, and my interest in that may be nothing. So I'm not going to tell you what you should value as a community or as individuals. I'm going to ask you, what do you value? What are you trying to accomplish? And if I can find a way to help you accomplish the same thing and still not do something I find abhorrent, I'm going to go down that path. But I don't need to tell you what you should want. All I need to do is say, if you want to achieve this end, these are the points I'm going to resist you at. And I would argue in most situations, doing a horrible act like this in a human scenario is unnecessary and counterproductive to the goals of the individuals who are doing the act and who are receiving the act. And we can use the con their context in order to show them the negative impact it's having on their community. Anyways, that's my argument for moral relativism in the context of the conversation between Sam Harris and David Deutsch. I have to put this out in the world, so I'm going to end it here.